but I do actually know the literal guy who runs the YouTube algorithm. His name's Todd. Uh, <laughs> and he's told me a lot about how it works. And it's not secret arcane information. It's actually about as obvious as you would think if you didn't overthink it. Hello, my friend. Welcome back to another episode of Creative Elements. Now, I got to tell you, I'm really enjoying learning a lot about YouTube over the last few weeks. And my natural inclination is to meet and learn from a bunch of other YouTubers to shorten my learning curve. Which brings me to today's guest. A couple months ago, my guest on episode number 102, Tiago Forte, introduced me to Thomas Frank. Thomas Frank is a YouTuber, podcaster, and author who helps people be more capable and productive. His main channel, Thomas Frank, has nearly two and a half million subscribers, and he has more than 160 million views on that channel. Now, Thomas has been on YouTube since 2006, but he tells me that he's been serious about it since about 2014. For people who don't know me, I got my start as a college success blogger when I was in college. And I had a blog called College Info Geek, it's still online today, and I would basically write blog posts and eventually did a podcast on how to be a better student and excel in college. College Info Geek started in 2010 as a blog. And today, that website is one of the most popular college advice websites with more than 400,000 monthly visits. Now, Thomas wasn't actually satisfied with just pure knowledge transfer. He didn't want to have your standard how-to videos on that channel. He wanted more high production. And as a result, when you watch videos on Thomas's channel, they almost feel cinematic. That level of production and care in videos on YouTube is really, really rare. So I asked Thomas where that inspiration actually came from. I started watching YouTube videos from people not necessarily in the college niche. There actually weren't a whole lot of people in that niche making videos, but I was following you know, your Pat Flynn's and your Fizzle guys and all those people who, you know, five, six years ago were really, really big in the online business space. And they were starting to get into video, which I was watching and sort of wanting to mimic. And then I was also sort of just spending like lunch times and free time sometimes watching YouTubers who did like video game content. So a couple that come to mind for me are uh, Cat Icarus. He still makes videos that are like insanely well edited. They're very silly. Satchel Drakes was a video essayist at the time who was making these really thoughtful think pieces about game design and how games affect society. So I was watching that kind of stuff and from both angles going, well, I kind of want to do this as well. Like, I want to try it out. One last thing you should know about Thomas. In 2020, he was producing more and more educational content on Notion specifically, which is a task management and note-taking tool. An interesting decision that he made was to create an entirely new YouTube channel for that content under Thomas Frank Explains. That channel has nearly 80,000 subscribers already and nearly 3 million views. So in this episode, we talk about Thomas's YouTube journey, why he created a second channel for his Notion content, how he's thinking about shorts and other short form video content, and all the details that go into his business. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode as you listen. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram at jklaus or leave a comment here on YouTube. I love to hear that you're listening, but now let's dive in. Let's talk with Thomas. I didn't set out to become a YouTuber. I set out to create video content that would be sort of like a way to shake up the content on my blog. And I even remember specifically like spending a ton of time designing a new post template in WordPress that would have the video be the featured image at the top of the blog post. And then when I got to actually hosting the video, I wasn't sure if I should put it on YouTube or if I should put it on Wistia, <sighs> which for people who don't know, Wisti is a paid hosting service where you have to pay for the bandwidth you use. So the more successful you are, the more you pay. Doesn't have an algorithm, doesn't have no anything. No discoverability. But <laughs> I didn't know about the algorithm back then. Nobody knew about the algorithm. We all thought, oh, we're, we're building through Twitter and LinkedIn and Pinterest and SEO on Google, hopefully. So I was just like, I need a video hosting service and Wistia has some cool features. Like you can capture emails on the player, which is pretty cool, but you know, it costs money and no algorithm. So I'm like, well, I don't want to pay. So I'm going to go with YouTube. And you know, that's in hindsight, one of those pivotal decisions, I would say. <laughs> it's insane. It's insane to think about like what would have happened if you made the other like very reasonable decision to host on yeah. a platform that's optimized just for hosting videos. I think I would have eventually come around to YouTube. 
And I can look at people in my industry who did this very thing. I mean, the Fizzle guys were hosting their stuff on Wistia and they were actually one of my original inspirations to do this because they had taken snippets of their courses that were in their paid community and turned them into videos that were like little blog post header images essentially. Uh, and they were hosting them on Wistia. So that was sort of like, my North Star, like, oh, I want something like that, but I don't want to pay for Wistia. And they eventually got into YouTube. Pat Flynn eventually got into YouTube. So I think, you know, I wouldn't have never gone to YouTube. It just would have been a little later. One of my favorite things to do is to go to a YouTube creator's videos and sort them by oldest and look at their first videos, expecting them to be trash. Your videos, <laughs> your first videos aren't trash. It's so frustrating. How are they so good out of the gate? Did you delete well, the, some things? The first one is like, <laughs> the first one is me like pounding nails into my college dorm room wall and putting up Christmas lights. So that one's pretty trash. Actually, a lot of videos have been deleted or taken down. I've had my YouTube channel since 2006. So how old would I, I would have been 15 at the time. And I started that, it was, I mean, YouTube started in 2005. So we were on YouTube really early. The channel was originally my brother and my place to just like dump stupid videos we we're making in our backyard. So it was like that at first. And then I volunteered to be the AV guy for my school's Battle of the Bands. So all the band videos were on that. And then when I was doing College Info Geek, like, occasionally throughout my college career, I would make a video, but it was never serious. It was like, oh, I'm gonna review this webcam that I got. Or like we, had, I had a, a review of a fighting game fight stick that you could plug into an <laughs> Xbox 360. Like it was a <laughs> dumping ground. And I had like 90 subscribers. So I count my true start on YouTube as August, 2014, when I made that video called, um, it's like a four step process to a more productive day or something like that. That was the one where I was like, okay, I wanna give YouTube a try. And then I started publishing weekly immediately after that. What did growth of the channel look like then? You know, you're posting this on the blog, you weren't thinking about being a YouTuber. When did that change mm -hmm. and why? So for the first few videos, I thought I was actually going to grow faster than I did because I already had the blog audience. So I thought naturally everyone's gonna come over from the blog and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, and that didn't happen. Then I hit upon a strategy that was actually fairly effective for like, you know, numbers that would be impressive to somebody who has 90 subscribers. And that was actually promoting via Reddit. And this is interesting because most people who have tried to promote via Reddit quickly find out that people on Reddit hate self-promotion. <laughs> Permanently banned forever. And the first time you post <laughs> one of your videos on Reddit, yeah, you're perma-banned and they're just like, stop self-promoting. But I found a way to do it right. I found this subreddit called Get Studying. And it was a small one. I think it was like 30,000 subscribers. So usually like not even 100 people online at any given time. And the first thing I did was I'm like, okay, I don't want to be coming in here just like spamming my stuff and not providing value. So I would spend like an hour a day answering people's questions as detailed as I could because I was a college blogger. I'm like, I'm here to help people in college. Why not just be in this community and help make it better? And then I would start linking to videos and finally I would start submitting them. But then every, every single time I did, I would put in the comments a summary of the video. So I'm like, if you don't wanna watch the video, if you don't wanna go to YouTube, here's exactly what I cover. This video is on test anxiety. This video is on how to triage your reading assignments. Here's exactly how to do it. And people really appreciated that and they started actually watching. And then video, I believe number eight was a video that I didn't intend to make actually, but it's the one that went viral and sort of blew my channel up. So it's called, I don't feel like it is a mindset for amateurs. I don't feel like it is a tragically common phrase for people who are students and for people who work in creative fields. And it's really something that limits your potential and that limits your productivity when you're trying to get things done. Here's the thing about, I don't feel like it. When you say it, when you think it, when you feel it, it doesn't change what you can do next. It does nothing to actually limit your decisions going forward. So when you say, I don't feel like it, you're simply giving yourself an excuse not to do the work that you know you need to do. It doesn't actually prevent you from opening your laptop and typing a paper. It doesn't actually prevent you from opening a book and studying for a while. It just lets you give yourself an excuse to not do those things. And the reason I made the video is I had put myself on a once per week publishing schedule every Friday. I even had a tool called Beeminder set up that would actually charge me money if I did not get a new video into my RSS feed for the little bot to see it. And that week I had planned on making a video about 80-20, the Pareto principle. And my outline, uh, this is very funny to me now because I look back and the outline was not that big at all, but for the time, the outline was huge. And I went, it's Wednesday, my <laughs> dudes. I cannot make this video this week. So I stand in front of my camera and I'm like, I don't feel like making a video, but hey, that's a good idea. 
<laughs> if I don't feel like it, it doesn't mean I can't do it. It just means I don't want to, and I can push past that. So I made that video and I didn't submit that one to Reddit. Someone else did. And it got on the productivity subreddit, which has a lot more people and went sort of viral. I think it was like 40,000 views in one day. Took my channel from around 100 subscribers to 2,200 overnight. Wow. And that was the moment where I went, oh, I should be a YouTuber first, not a blogger who does YouTube on the side. <laughs> so how did that change your approach? What did you immediately change or soon thereafter change to, to lean into YouTube more? Well, when I think back on it, uh, I, I, mean, I have like a lot of recorded material on my process here. I don't think it changed a ton because I was already in the middle of a couple of projects. First and foremost, I was having a ton of fun with videos. And with every video, I was like, well, let me try something new. Maybe I can like keyframe and make an animation on this one, or maybe I can light myself a little better. And I call it the 1% rule. Get 1% better every time, publish on a schedule. You have all these little tiny improvements all the time, regularly. And I'd also promised my audience that I was gonna write this like 5,000 word PDF on how to get better grades. And it was supposed to be like my little email bon email list bonus sign up thing that everyone was doing back then. Well, that ended up ballooning into an entire book, <laughs> <laughs> which I called 10 Steps to Earning Awesome Grades. It was supposed to be a 10 step listicle, but it turned out to be like an actual book. It's over a hundred pages. Still gave it away for free, but now I was like, okay, I'm gonna take what I've learned from blogging and I'm just gonna apply it to YouTube. I'm gonna make a video every week. I'm gonna make it as good as I can because I'm having fun. And at the end, I'll do the same thing I do with blog posts. I will say, sign up to my email newsletter and you'll get the free book. And that was pretty much my business model for the next like two years, just cranking away, making videos. One, one bit of context that is useful for me is when I was a senior in college, I wrote a post on how to build a WordPress website and I got signed up with the web host I was using at the time. They had an affiliate program that ended up ranking very highly on Google. Mm. So I had like a pretty decent passive income source for a while. And instead of trying to go super hardcore into like WordPress tutorials to grow that, I was like, that is my ticket to be able to make all this content on academic success without having to sell a course. Because I just want... I want this to exist in the world. I want there to be a great YouTube channel that's like Vlog Brothers or Crash Course quality on how to study. And I don't feel comfortable selling like a $500 course to students or whatever. So it was sort of like this beautiful, chaotic thing that happened that that was just like able to make money. And another funny thing, I didn't turn on AdSense until 100,000 subscribers. Hmm. So I was making zero dollars from YouTube Why? <laughs> for like the first year. Why not AdSense? I mean, I get the 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 not selling to your users part because even if you were comfortable mm. selling a $500 course to college students, like they don't have it. But AdSense, you could turn yeah, on, no. right? So why why not? <laughs> it wasn't an ethical thing. It was, it was the business thing. So I come from a blogging background. And when you come from a blogging background, it was all about what can you do on your website to optimize email opt-ins mm. for your list? The funny thing was I wasn't selling anything. So I don't even know why I was trying to build a list. I just knew that I was super interested in it. And I was reading Smart Passive Income and Social Triggers. And Derek Halpern was like, oh, if you make your buttons purple, you'll actually increase your conversion rate by 0.5%. So that's the mindset <laughs> I came into with YouTube. And I'm like, well, if they see an ad at the beginning of the video, fewer of them are going to get to the end mm. and sign up for my email newsletter. So I'm going to keep AdSense off. And then I remember having a conversation with my friend Sean Davis in San Diego. He bought me a peanut butter beer, only peanut butter beer I've ever liked. Oh, I love peanut butter beer. Can't remember what it was called. I've had a few others and they're just not that great, but this one was fantastic. And then he's like, I watch all your videos and I watch Crash Course and I watch all these other channels too. Let me tell you, Tom, when I see an ad on YouTube, I don't think that jerk Thomas Frank turned ads on. No, I think YouTube is showing me an ad and I'm going to skip it. And I'm just used to seeing them on every video. So there's it does absolutely nothing to how long I choose to watch a video. It's just like part of the platform. It's not something that I fault the creator for. So I went, huh, that makes sense. Turned on AdSense and was making like a couple of grand a month overnight. After a quick break, Thomas and I talk about the growth of his channel and how he has structured his creator business today. And later we talk about why he created a second channel for his Notion content. So stick around and we'll be right back. Hey, thanks for watching Creative Elements. This is a brand new channel here on YouTube. So liking the videos, leaving comments, subscribing to the channel, sharing the show, 
All that support goes a long, long way right now. It is all seen, it is all appreciated. And even though this is a brand new channel here on YouTube, I've actually been conducting interviews with creators just like this for more than two years. There are more than 100 interviews that you can go back and listen to with creators like Seth Godin, James Clear, Cody Sanchez, Tori Dunlap, even YouTubers like Ali Abdal, Matt Diavella, Roberto Blake, and Marie Poulin. I've actually created some playlists for you to help get you started, to dive into some of the best episodes that we've done to date. Just go to creativeelements.fm slash playlists. The link is also down below in the description, but you can filter episodes there by platform or medium. If you wanna just look at uh, episodes with YouTubers or just episodes with Instagrammers, you can do that with those starter playlists at creativeelements.fm slash playlists. And again, the link is down below in the description. Welcome back to my conversation with Thomas Frank. Before the break, Thomas was telling us about his delayed decision to turn on monetization for his channel. Now, Thomas is not the only creator to delay turning on monetization for fear of how their audience would react. There's a lot of like self doubt that I think creators have that I have lived through on, you know, thinking the audience is going to hate you if you do anything. Oh man, I remember uh, I took my book, which was a free PDF and people were like, please make it a print book, please. I want to buy it in print. So I sign up for Amazon create space, get that figured out, edit my own book and I make it as cheap as possible. So I think it's like $8. Sometimes Amazon changes the price themselves. And then I'm like, well, I might as well make it a Kindle edition too, just, you know, in case people want it there. And I remember having so much anxiety because you cannot make a book perpetually free on mm. Kindle. They won't let you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what if somebody pays a dollar for my book on Kindle because they didn't know about my blog and then they find out later it was free and they get really mad at me. Not a single person. Not a single ah, person. So relatable been, though. Like, eight years. No one has ever complained. So relatable. I think a lot of creatives are <laughs> empaths. So you start to like think about what is the backlash that might happen for this thing? And even though it's, even mm. anecdotally, if it does happen and it's like one or two people versus thousands who said nothing or didn't mm -hmm. care, we just feel that so viscerally. <laughs> and something I try to live by is like, sometimes people will criticize you, but you have to realize like, well, the way you're doing something, maybe you could improve it, but there's also a reality where like, if you did it the way they did it, you wouldn't have done it at all. Recently, I saw a tweet, somebody like this was, they were coming hard with this take. They were like, recording a loom is inherently a selfish act. Whoa. Because anytime people want to reference the information, they now have to scrub back through it. And I'm like, that's an interesting take. Here's my alternative take. Loom makes it very easy for me to explain complex processes on a computer in a way that I could not do in the same amount of time if I were taking screenshots and writing it. So there are many, many, many answers and many, many customer support threads that I would have never answered in the first place. Yeah, scorching so hot So it's take. not selfish, it's you're creating resources that otherwise would not have existed because the speed of creation is so much faster. Oh my gosh. And would I like an AI tool that turns that into a blog post eventually? Heck yes, I would, but you know, we use the tools we have. It even auto creates captions for you. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's pretty it's, crazy. <laughs> and it auto creates a transcript that you can, I believe, click on to zoom the video immediately to where it is. So like, it's it's pretty good. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty strong take. Mm -hmm. Well, help me understand, you know, you had this, this video that went viral on Productivity Reddit, brought your channel from 100 to 2,200 subscribers. You say, oh, wow, I'm going to go in on this. That's still a far cry away from two and a half million. So what started moving mm -hmm. the needle? What has moved the needle over the years to really grow the channel into the, the behemoth that it is now? I mean, it's, it's very gradual. I've been making videos for a long time. I can think back to a few things that are probably catalysts for growth when I look back on them. But honestly, that viral spike was really the the one honest, like the one viral spike I can remember. Most of my other videos, and I, I could be wrong if I go back into the catalog, but most of my other videos like have done well, have some have done, you know, exceptionally well, some have done bad, but a lot of them have kind of grown over the years. And when you go to my most popular videos, like if you sort by most popular, none of those videos were super viral hits. So a lot of the stuff on the channel has been slow burner kind of stuff. And I kind of like that. Now I have this philosophy that like, the human brain's not built for gigantic perceived jumps in progress because there's always a come down and that causes anxiety. And a lot of times you don't know how to handle the new normal that is brought about by this huge jump. That's why lottery winners often are so sad. That's what's so compelling to me about YouTube and why I'm so frustrated with myself for not taking it more seriously as a platform earlier because I focused on email and podcasting. 
two platforms with inherently no discoverability whatsoever. And mm -hmm. the back catalog, while valuable, just needs someone to direct it, direct them to it for it to have any play. Yeah. There's no search. And with email, it. do you even have a back catalog? Like, do you publish well, your newsletters? Well, I, I basically publish every newsletter as a blog post. So if, if that gotcha. was optimized in a way where those were answering questions more than me talking about something that I think is valuable, then it could have mm -hmm. some evergreen value there. But I don't structure my newsletter because I go newsletter first instead of blog post first. And I don't structure my newsletter as like, I'm going to answer gotcha. a very specific question. Uh, so there's not a lot of search value in that either, which just makes me look back yeah. on years of work and say that was not very efficient. <laughs> mm. But it teaches you lessons. It helps you be strategic in many ways. Like it's not, you know, it's not like it, you wasted it. It's just like, but yeah, there, you definitely start to realize, oh, this platform doesn't have discoverability, which, yeah, I remember like watching certain people put out, um, you know, content saying like, oh, you have to start a podcast this year. It's like the number one thing to make. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not because you're putting out an hour of material that can only be taken in through the linear sense we have hearing, you know, visual sense is very scan based and there's just no way to discover it. There's no way to share it. Like you can, I guess if you want to go through the work of creating little snippets, you can, but you know, people like watching a heck of a lot more than a dude sitting on a desk doing a podcast snippet, they like watching real videos with, you know, scripting and skits and all kinds of fun stuff. So that's what discoverability is. Totally. And then what I think a podcast is, is an, a relationship deepener. 100%. Because the one thing a podcast does have is an uncanny ability to have people pay attention to you for a very long time. How familiar are you, are you with um, video-based podcasts? I don't even know if you call them podcasts if they're on YouTube that are mm -hmm. long form that are doing really well. You know, you have like the Joe Rogan example, you have Lewis Howes. Right. How many of those are you aware of beyond that? H3, um, Impulsive. Back in the day, there was that one that the Max Mofo's friend was on. Matt Diavella I don't know, they did talked it about for a like, while. Oh yeah, Matt did it for a while too. Yes, but there's a common thread among all of those. They are, and I'm trying to think if there's an exception, they are guest-based and they grow because there are interesting guests on them mm -hmm. or they're started by a celebrity. When you think about your overall business now, like what are the, the projects or buckets? Do you think of it as one entity? Do you think of it as multiple entities? Because you have all of these different elements to it now. For a very long time, I, I saw my business as this two-pronged thing where there's the College and Bo Geek side and then there's the Thomas Frank side. And the College and Bo Geek side and Thomas Frank were once merged, once my YouTube channel was like, every video had a companion blog post on College and Bo Geek. And then I started realizing, I'm like 30. I shouldn't be, <laughs> number one, limiting my audience by saying, hey, I'm a college blogger. You know, number two, limiting my topics. So I started to slowly split those off and today now I have a head writer who does all the writing on College Info Geek. I am completely hands off on it. And then for the longest time, it was it was really just like the Thomas Frank YouTube channel was my main gig. And most income was coming through sponsorships. We still had some affiliate marketing, book sales, stuff like that. And then recently there's been the Notion stuff. And that started late 2020 because I was getting really into Notion, having a lot of fun building my own systems and templates. And I was like, well, I kind of want to, see about, you know, building a niche channel on this just to see, can it grow? Can this become an opportunity? And at the time, the intention was at some point, maybe I'll do a course or a template or something. And it'll be like a cool little side project. And it'll be a nice little, you know, side income as well. I was thinking extra three grand a month would be amazing from this project. And so I started Thomas Frank Explains in 2020, and then I made videos off and on. Didn't really have a crazy publishing schedule on it. Just whenever I had something interesting to share, I would do it in between videos on the main channel. And then this year, finally put together my uh, premium template, Ultimate Brain. And I guess last year I did also put out a template, so I should probably go back to that. Last year, took my YouTube and blog and podcast content planning system, turned that into a template, and released it, and started making like two to 300 bucks a day, going, whoa! People are buying this. Holy crap. So that was really interesting. And I'm like, let's, you know, start scaling systems and building stuff up. And then this year in April, I, I launched Ultimate Brain. And now it's making over 100K a month. Wow. Yeah. So far beyond the 3K per I, month that you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. It's like, 
it, it's like the everything I've ever done has been very slow evolution. Like from blogging to podcasting, that was you know dipping my toes in. Then going to YouTube, I felt like dipping my toes in, and I kept doing the blogging, the podcasting, kept spitting the plates. With this, it's it's just been so fast, and I think like I'm realizing like there's this huge pent up demand and this huge cultural interest around these no code tools that allow us to make bespoke workflows in a way we couldn't do before. So when I was doing this as sort of a side project, I was like, I'm just gonna have this as a side thing and I'm gonna keep making my YouTube videos because the majority of my income comes from sponsors and you know, that's where all my work goes. And then this just like blew up insanely and I'm having a lot of fun with it. I'm having a lot of fun with it. I did sponsored videos full time for five years and, you know, eventually it got to the point where I'm like, well, I know every video I'm putting out is helpful, but what exactly am I building now? Just mm. a bigger channel? Mm -hmm. Is there like a thing I'm pushing towards? So I kept trying to find like something I could really get into and go deep on. And for a while I was like, maybe I'll do personal finance content or maybe I'll do fitness content. And I couldn't really land on something that felt like it was the thing I was supposed to be doing until... I started getting into this stuff and I'm like, it's very niche, it's hyper niche. So there's a part of my identity that's like, well, you're never gonna pull the same amount of views on that. You should be worried about that. You know, this video only got 3000 views, but the, the, the it's sustainable as a business. And the way I feel about it every day when I work on it doesn't lie. Like I just have so much fun. So I feel like the majority of my business is sort of evolving along this sort of hybrid video creator approach where I'm not just making content all day, I'm actually making products and, doing customer support and stuff like that too. This seems like a trend I've found amongst YouTubers who've been doing it for a while. The monetization model seemed like it is AdSense and partnerships slash brand deals and selling directly to their audiences was not, I don't know if it was not culturally a thing uh, years ago or if it just didn't work or they didn't weren't thinking about it because I've always been the opposite. It's always been digital products first and now I'm starting to get mm -hmm. into sponsorships, but uh, I have kind of a ambivalence towards it because when you have an obligation to a sponsor because they've purchased inventory and in something that you've made, you no longer have the optionality of not making something, which is not why I got into making stuff to begin with. How do you feel about yeah. that? Do you feel attention at all? Oh, I definitely feel attention. Um, and, and for me, it was like sort of a blessing and a curse. The fact that I work with, and you know, I will say this wholeheartedly, I work with the best agency that exists on the planet, which is standard. Full disclosure, I'm a part owner because <laughs> the CEO lets any creator buy equity in the company. Oh, wow. As a way for us to have ownership and as a way for us to be able to vote on things that happens. Like he literally sold his equity so he couldn't be the sole decision maker. So that's my full disclosure out of the way. But part of the beauty of working with standard over the past few years is uh, PJ. PJ is like, he's been the talent manager for a very long time. And anytime I'm like, PJ, I'm super stressed out and I'm burned out and I cannot get this video done this month. He'll be like, I'll take care of it and he'll move it. Mm. And as a person who is prone to perfectionism and getting interested in uh, rabbit holes that take up way too much of my time, I've done that more times than I care to admit. But there's always been like this guilt, like oh, I'm supposed to get this video done for this sponsor, but I really want to take like an extra two weeks to go to the mountains and film drone footage for it, or I really want to like make this cool side resource. That's another thing. Like a lot, I think a lot of creators are very much content to make video and then go on to the next video. And that's totally fine. But like the video that I have planned next for TF explains requires me to write, I believe 50 articles for a side resource to make it into what I want to exist in the world. Like I know it would be helpful as a video, but if I release it with this cool resource as well, it'll be so much cooler and grander. So that kind of got at odds with the sponsorship model. And now it's kind of beautiful because when I was working for sponsors, like it was honestly sort of a step backward in terms of what I wanted for my business in terms of the way to set it up. Because with affiliate marketing, you make a post and it makes you money over time as long as it keeps getting traffic. With sponsors, you get paid up front. So it's almost like a job. And I didn't complain much because it made my income go way up. So it's like, you know, I can't complain that it's making me a lot more money than affiliate marketing did. But, you know, from a uh, work style point of view, it was like, you're booked for this much, you make the video, you get paid. And then the video, it, it does continue to generate value for you over the time through the AdSense and through the, the building of your channel. But if I make a video selling my own product or 
getting people into an email list that eventually brings them to a funnel if they're the right fit. Like it's a very different thing. It becomes an asset that just works over time instead of being a one-time payday. And I think that just suits my personality a lot better. When we come back, Thomas and I talk about his decision to create an entirely new YouTube channel for Notion tutorials versus publishing to his existing channel with millions of subscribers right after this. I'm thrilled to say that this episode is sponsored by Circle. Circle is an all-in-one membership community for creators and brands. It brings together engaging discussions, members, live streams, chats, events, and memberships all in one place, all under your brand. And Circle is what I use to run my own membership community. I love Circle because it has a clean, minimal design, and it's built with creators like you and I in mind. It's so easy to use, people love it, and it's easy for me to manage as a creator myself. I'm having so much fun supporting creators inside my membership, and it's become a huge part of my overall business. You can also easily create immersive live video experiences right inside of your Circle community. Whether it's a five-person group coaching call, a 50-person online class, or a 500-person broadcast with Q&A, Circle has you covered. If you're interested in testing out Circle for your own community, you can start your 14-day free trial by going to creativeelements.fm slash circle. That's creativeelements.fm slash circle, or visit the link down below in the description. Hey, welcome back. Now that I'm on YouTube, I'm learning a lot about YouTube channel architecture, how you actually set up and design your YouTube channel. And I see a lot of creators who actually decide to have entirely different channels for things like their shorts or even certain types of clips or certain themes that are happening within that channel. And so I asked Thomas to explain to me his decisions around YouTube channel architecture and why he made an entirely new channel for his Notion tutorials. When someone discovers your channel, you want them to binge your channel. Great example, recently I found this guy, Spencer Cornelia. He talks about fake gurus and scammers and stuff like that. And I found one of his videos and then I'm like, well, I wanna watch another one. So I just start going through his channel. And then the YouTube algorithm picks that up and will recommend me a lot of his videos. Mm. But I'll also go through his channel and, and click, click, click. And so I thought about that from the perspective of my own channel. And I know that people have been interested in Notion videos, but those are very broad videos. Like I've got one on the note-taking system and I've got the big one, which was my original one, which goes through my YouTube content planning system. I thought my Among Us game tracker would be a smash hit viral video and it was like super underperformer. But I realized like if I'm gonna make the channel for Notion education, Number one, if it's on my main channel, it's like half my videos or more coming out are gonna be these hyper niche, hyper technical videos and people who come for more general productivity content are gonna start to realize like when Tom publishes, most of the time it's like, here's how to replace HTTPS in your URL handler with Notion, like really, really niche stuff. The other thing is from the Notion side, Again, when somebody finds my video, I want them to go, what is this channel? Click on it and go, this is literally the channel. And that's like, that's how I think. How can I make the go-to resource? How can I make the thing where people go, how do I learn about that thing? Oh, you go to Thomas's channel. That's what it is. So for productivity, that's what the Thomas Frank channel is supposed to be. For Notion, that's what Thomas Frank explains it's supposed to be. So what's your plan for the main channel at this point? Is it just on pause while you do these Notion things? It's a little bit on pause, but I do see a lot of strategic overlap between Notion and specifically the products I'm selling and then what I can make on my main channel. That would also be... Uh, very valuable on its own. So one of my core philosophies and ethical tenets on my content is it has to be valuable on its own. So for that reason, I will never do a video where the sponsor is like needed for the value of the video to sink in. I often try to actually not have the perfect sponsor as the sponsor for a video. So like I remember one year I had um, like a study tips video planned and a resume video planned. And I believe like I had I put Skillshare on the study tips one because I was like, oh, this is too close. <laughs> this is too close. And that might have been a, b- a little bit overboard, but you kind of get the idea. The other thing is I don't want to make a video that's just an ad. So even the video going over Ultimate Brain, it's 48 minutes long, not to be a 48 minute ad, but to literally show every part of the template because I wanted people to be able to go and build it themselves if they didn't want to buy it. It's like, you, you can buy it. I'll pitch it at the end, but otherwise let me show you every part of it. And with like the whole second brain thing, there's a lot of information people can learn. How do you efficiently capture information that comes in via Twitter or books you read or the internet? How do you capture your own ideas? How do you sift through and review your own ideas? There's all these great concepts that I don't have, either don't have videos on, or there are videos that are better than ones I already have out that I can go make. 
And there's a lot of synergy there. So I could, I could easily push people over to the Notion channel if they're interested in Notion, but they'll also be able to learn if I do a video like GTD or Para or whatever it is. How does that pushing over work? Does it require you to just do call to actions in your videos that you're putting out? Or does YouTube know like, hey, these are related channels because he's linked them. And so we will recommend more often the TF Explains channel to his regular Thomas Frank subscribers? Yes, both. I will not claim to be an uh, expert for the algorithm, but I do actually know the literal guy who runs the YouTube algorithm. His name's Todd. Uh, <laughs> and he's told me a lot about how it works. And it's not secret arcane information. It's actually about as obvious as you would think if you didn't overthink it. The algorithm, uh, in the words of my agent Dave, is like a puppy that just wants to make its owner happy. And in this case, the owner is the audience. So it brings what it thinks the owner wants. Uh, and that's why Todd always says like, don't try to think about the algorithm, try to think about the audience. What does the audience want? And if YouTube perceives with all of its machine learning knowledge that a certain person in the audience is really interested in personal knowledge management and second brain stuff and productivity and happens to be interested in Notion, you can bet Thomas Frank Explains is gonna show up in their home feed, even if they were originally watching a video on Thomas Frank. And you can verify that for yourself by going and watching a couple of my videos and seeing just how quickly Matt Diavella or Ali Abdal or Nathaniel Drew pop up in my feed or Karma Medic. Those people aren't me. They have different channels, but you're going to see them no matter so what. So it doesn't even have to literally be linked as my other channels on YouTube. You're saying it's mm -hmm. just they understand like a lookalike audience or they understand like the type of content yep. a person's looking for. Yep. You're and honestly like, so I won't say your titles don't matter. Your description doesn't matter, but like Google auto transcribes your videos. They have a uh, graphical machine learning AI that scans every frame of your video and attempts to pick out objects and tag them. Like, so anything you upload to YouTube, they're going to catalog it, tag it, and then tie that to their user data metrics. So if you're watching stuff on like, recently I've been watching a lot of One Piece content, I'm gonna get a ton of One Piece channels, not just Grand Line Review, the one that I've been watching the most. Another interesting thing I saw in looking at your channel is you've posted like four total YouTube shorts, one on the TF Explains channel, I think three on your main channel, and they've all done really well, seemingly. They have a lot of use, obviously not a big part of your uh, strategy. So how do you think about YouTube shorts and if that extends into short form vertical video generally, I'd love to hear it. I would like to do more Notion focused shorts content. I would not like to do more general shorts content. So I tried those out, they did okay, there was one that did pretty well. I think it was like the, if you're procrastinating right now, do this or mm -hmm. watch this. That one did over half a million. Uh, the other two actually were pretty much underperformers. And, you know, it was no sweat off my back because it didn't take much time to make them. But everything I do involves an opportunity cost. And I like to make big, huge, very valuable resources. And that takes a lot of focus and a lot of time. So if you're doing a lot of short-based content, you're basically saying, well, I'm going to split my attention up into a ton of different slices instead of, focusing all my attention on one big thing. And I just would rather focus my attention on one big thing. The caveat there is Notion stuff, I think could be great on TikTok, could be great on YouTube Shorts. And the model I look at there is this woman uh, who goes by Miss Excel. Mm -hmm. She was on the Decoder podcast last year with Neela Patel. Uh, and she was making like six figures a month. I think she even had a couple of six figure days and her whole marketing model is she makes TikTok videos where she dances to pop music while showing like a pivot table transform in Excel. And then her link in bio is like a sign up form for a webinar. And people show up and she does these webinars. And I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure they're pre recorded. Not totally sure yet, though. <laughs> and then people buy her courses, you know, and you can buy her course bundle for $1,000. It gets you all of them. Or I think like the cheapest course is 300 bucks. So she's got this massive audience on TikTok that are being funneled to her courses. And so whenever I, anybody says like, oh, I made a short and I only got paid five cents for 10 billion views, this is such a ripoff. I think you had 10 billion views and you didn't direct them anywhere. Yeah. Like you gotta think of your content as a marketing vehicle. And it's the most beautiful, useful marketing vehicle that has ever existed in the history of humankind. Because 30 years ago, if you wanted an ad that would reach a million people, you would pay probably a million dollars for it to be on the Super Bowl. Right. So <laughs> as you think about your uh, potential shorts future, if you think that Notion stuff would do well on shorts, are you thinking that the, the plan is to direct them 
directly to the, the templates? Or do you think of that as a growth and discoverability lever for your existing YouTube channel? It depends on the individual piece of content. So it's important to think of content as a worker that you're employing. Every piece of content has a job to be done. I actually got into a little Twitter debate about this the other day because there was a person who was saying, oh, on my blog, I have some posts that are like lists of the best X product in this niche and their affiliate posts. Like their entire point is to drive affiliate conversions and make me money. And then I have other posts that are educational posts. And I noticed that on my educational posts, people are signing up for my newsletter a lot more than on my affiliate posts. So what can I do to bring the affiliate post uh, email sign up conversion percentage mm -hmm. up to match the EDU one? And I like that you're looking at it all wrong. What are the jobs that you are assigning to these pieces of content? Educational content, free educational content, your CT or your, your call to action CTA is to have people engage with more of your content and maybe eventually down the line buy something or support you. But you know you want them to sign up for your email newsletter so they keep following you. But if you make an entire post full of affiliate products and the entire point is to make conversions, sure, it's great if people sign up for your email list, but the point of that piece of content is to drive conversions. So when you make a video, you gotta ask, what's the job I'm assigning to this video? If it's 10 cool tricks you've never heard about in Notion, I want you to sign it or to subscribe to my channel to watch more stuff. If it's here is how to manage a second brain inside of Notion, I want you to buy my template. But I have to make that decision on a per piece of content basis, not on a per channel basis, because the viewer doesn't think about the channel, the viewer thinks about the topic and why they clicked. Yeah, so good. I, I love thinking about jobs to be done framework when, when it comes up. It's You can boil so many things down to that, even like your product strategy, you know, or why people would join your membership, why they joined your community, you know, what is the job mm -hmm. that that community is doing for it? Love breaking that down on a content by content basis. I've heard you say before that you have this habit that you, you kind of speak to as not your favorite thing, but I think it might be one of your favorite things, uh, which is making everything free that you can or making like so many things free <laughs> instead of making them paid things. How, mm -hmm. how do you sit with that today? Where's your head at on when to make a product or a, a resource free versus uh, a paid product. I still want to make everything free. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I guess there's like the eternal struggle because I do like money. It's like that line from Idiocracy. I can't believe you like money too. Like, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do actually like having money, not to keep score. I think a lot of like where very wealthy people see money as like a score in their life. For me, it's pure optionality. It's like, I wanna be able to do what I wanna do. I wanna be able to go spend the entire day coding at the coffee shop on something that I'm gonna make free. Or I wanna go to Hawaii next week and just laze around and go ride bikes and whatever. Like money allows me to do that. And for the people on my team, bringing in more income is the, or with the, in, in the business allows me to pay them more, allows me to help them meet their financial goals as well. But I like making things free. You know, I just look at stuff like, I think the, the one that really, really got me in the beginning was Crash Course. John and Hank Green made this channel. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's basically school the channel. And I loved it so much because there's these ultra high quality series of videos on all the main school topics. John Green taught world history. Hank Green taught chemistry. He taught um, biology. And that was like one of my original influences coming up as a YouTuber. I remember being you know, absolute beginner YouTuber. And I was like, this is amazing. I want to model my channel after Crash Course. And someday I would love to teach a Crash Course. Uh, and actually was able to do that. 2017, they hired me to do Crash Course study it's skills. Amazing. So I'm on that channel. And that's like one of my crowning achievements in life, even though it made me very little money. <laughs> I think they paid me like, maybe it was a thousand dollars or something. I don't know. I wrote 10 full videos, researched them, hosted them. Like, and I didn't care how much money I made. I remember people been like, they should have paid you more for that. Like, I don't care. I wanted to do it. I wanted this thing to exist in the world and now it does. And whenever I think about a thing I could create, my first instinct is, man, wouldn't it be cool if people could just have that for free? Like today I was looking at the free code camp channel. Dude, like every video on there is like three hours long. There was a data visualization course on free code camp. It's literally 19 hours long. One video, 19 hours. Everything on there is free. Wow. And they have this JavaScript website and there's just hundreds and hundreds of JavaScript exercises. And you can teach yourself JavaScript just going through these exercises, they're all free. Like, that's amazing. I think this is the opportunity for so many creators, but it, you got this like chicken and egg problem because information does want to be free. So if you make something amazing and you make it free, that can be really, really good for you in the short and long term. Mm -hmm. But so many people getting started, 
they don't have the the blog post that's earning enough affiliate commission to give them the time mm-hmm. and headspace to do that. That's what's so hard for people when they're kind of in the yep. starting state, I feel. But like, so yeah, I think you have to be strategic because even in the beginning, I was like, I want everything to be free, but web hosting is not free. And then it, and it's like, it, it gets to that point where you're like, okay, if I make 90% of the things free, what's the one thing I can have that isn't free? And is it a thing that I don't think is like, super essential. So like, I never wanted to charge for academic success stuff because it was like, in my opinion, stuff they should have taught in school. Even with my Skillshare course, my Skillshare course was the first course I ever put out that was technically behind a paywall. And I did it as an original with Skillshare. And there was a big, cool strategic hack behind that that we can talk about. But the reason I picked Skillshare was they had a free trial. Hmm. And every sponsor spot I've ever done for them has been like one month free trial or whatever they're running two weeks. And that means if you want to take my course and you cannot afford it, you can use a trial and I will not be mad if you cancel because they know most people cancel. So go take my course for free. And if you find it valuable, keep paying for it. What's the big strategic hack behind it that we can talk about later? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a big one. This is the big one. I don't know if it still works anymore. <laughs> There's like this thing in business. They say like, uh, if, if a business leader is telling you their secrets, it's already too late. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe it is actually too late. I'm not sure. Uh, Let's find out. It might Up not to actually the listener be too to late. Find out. Yeah. So, so here's <laughs> what I did. Skillshare had what they called originals at the time. And this was, I think it was 2017. At the time, no YouTuber had made an original. It was like, Aaron Draplin, Draplin design guy. I think Seth Godin had one, which has been pulled down actually. Gary Vaynerchuk had one, but like no like, you know, full-time YouTuber had done an original. The other thing I really, so that was the first thing is if I do an original, it's a way to differentiate myself and it's a way to add value to my sponsors. So I'm like, let me just do that because I think that's gonna help me build relationships. It might open doors like, And I actually gave up something pretty big on it. I gave up intellectual property rights Mm. to the course. When you make an original, they own it. If you just upload your own course to Skillshare, you own it and they're just hosting it. So I'm like, yes, I'm giving up this, I'm doing work, but I think it's going to separate me. But the other big thing is when Skillshare sponsors you as a YouTuber, you have to recommend a course on Skillshare. And do you know what courses they will allow you to recommend? Originals and staff picks. Ah. So I went, if I do an original, I don't own it, but there are other YouTubers out there who may see it in the list of courses that they're allowed to promote and they're going to promote it. And now I get calls from friends sometimes like, I was just watching this uh, Minecraft YouTuber and I saw your face in my video. Like what's going on? (laughs) Amazing. So when you're saying that you wanted to differentiate yourself, you're talking about on the Skillshare platform from other courses. Yes. In fact, when I made the first decision to do the original, I did not know about the sponsor thing. Um, That drove my decision to make my second course an original. But the first time I was like, if I do an original, they're going to see it as a piece of their flagship content because they helped make it. It's their, one of their originals. So it might end up on the homepage, might end up in advertisements down the line. I don't know, but it's a way for me to not just be a YouTuber promoting this service. It's a way for me to be a part of it. And that's, kind of been like something I've tried to do with every one of my sponsors if I could is like, how can I put a bit of me into it? Because the audience just wants more of you. If they get to the end of your video where your sponsor spot is, what they've signaled is they want more of you. So like, that's the reason that I did an audiobook version of my audiobook. Cause I was like, if I do an audible spot, I can be like, hey, my book's on audible and you can use my code down there to get it for free. Check it out. I have classes on Skillshare. It's not just a thing I'm promoting. And I haven't been able to do that for every single platform. Like Brilliant doesn't do user-generated content and I'm not an engineer anyway. So (laughs) they shouldn't have me writing (laughs) the chemistry course or whatever it is. But wherever I've had the opportunity to really add value and become a part of my sponsors, I've done it. We were talking before we started recording, you said you were the only full-time employee of your company right now, right? At the moment, yes. By the time this is out, it might be different. Okay. Uh, Well, I'm interested to hear, if you were to make a full-time hire, what position would you be filling? Well, I mean, I have people on my team who who work like equivalent to full-time. We're just in the process of Ah, truly hiring them full-time. And when you get into business, you realize like this is a hard thing to do. You got to figure out unemployment insurance and payroll and like, so what I've learned is contact a bookkeeper who can do this for you your job will drop when they give you the price quote and then it's probably worth it anyway. <laughs> so what is the uh, what is the 
Thomas Frank team look like right now? There is Martin, who is my best friend. Uh, he's been my best friend since college. And he does kind of anything that needs to be done. He is a learning machine who can hyper-focus on anything for a very long period of time. So for a long time, he was my podcast co-host. He was the editor for my podcast. He has designed uh, every version of College Info Geek since 2012. And now I just put him on hard programming problems. Mm. Like we we wanted to figure out how to do proper recurring tasks on Notion. And he's the one who wrote the insane set of formulas to make that work. And like basically had to rediscover how awful it is to work with time zones <laughs> with programming. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so yeah, he, I mean, he's done that. He's done like some crazy website optimization. So he's like kind of like special ops, I guess. Tony is my editor and also anything video. So he's, whether it's like walking on a frozen lake, filming me for a video, or it's, you know, helping me with set deck or it's editing or animation. Like that's all he does. Alex, we just hired, he is our support guy for the Notion templates. And he is absolutely kicking butt in our community. I feel very lucky to have found him because he wants to do community support. It's like his thing. So it's amazing. It's been great working with him so far. Uh, I've got a personal assistant. Her name's Amanda. I actually work with her through a company called Double. So she's not strictly part of my team. I actually pay with a credit card. That's okay. I'm, I'm interested in like all of these. She seems like part of my team. Part-time contract type people trying to just get a, a mm -hmm. feel for the breadth of it. And then there's uh, Ransom and he's the guy who runs College and Book Geek now. So that is mostly writing new content, updating old content and doing some business development with affiliate partners. Who or what type of position do you wish you would have hired for or outsourced for sooner? Editing. Editing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Every YouTuber, every creator should hire an editor way sooner than you think you should. Let me tell you, every and I felt this, I have a unique editing style that nobody can replicate. And it's the secret sauce to my channel's success. When I put this 16 frame quadratic eased in curve to this cool title card that I made, that's why my audience subscribes to my channel. Not because I'm interesting and charismatic and I have good research. Nope, it's my editing and nobody else can do that. This is false. <laughs> 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 and let me tell you how much stress I have removed from my life because I don't have to edit every single video now. It is beautiful. And Tony loves to edit. That's, that's his thing. He loves editing. And I grew out of it. I heard you say in another interview, I think someone passed this on to you, what is your art versus your ego? I took a note of that. Yes. I was like, that's so good. Yeah, that was Charlie from Charisma on Command. I think that was like VidCon 2017. He told me that. What's your art? What's your ego? What's the thing you're doing because it's propping your ego up and because you're not willing to challenge your assumption that somebody else could do it just as good, if not better than you. And that's the thing, like when you're an entrepreneur, you have to realize like what you can do at the absolute peak of your capabilities is probably not what you're actually going to output because there are so many plates for you to spin. So even if you are a fantastic editor, if that's not what you wanna be doing or there's something else where you can create more value or you get more fulfillment, even if somebody currently is not at your level of editing skill, they're gonna do just as good, if not better, than you would do at your diminished capacity while you're trying to spin all the other plates. Mm. And then if you foster them and provide them resources and provide them feedback and help them to get better and they want that, they'll eventually become better than you ever were. So good, this is exactly what I need to be hearing right now. What's, what's frustrating for you or what's hard for you right now as a creator? Honestly, the biggest frustration for me at the moment is still feeling like I should be putting out more content, even though I want to sort of like hole up in a cave and make really cool things that take months and months. I think this is like, this is every creator's struggle. Every day you go on Twitter and you see yet another person who just had a viral thread or just made $100,000 or whatever it is. And you're like, dang it, I should be <laughs> tweeting these fire <laughs> threads 10 times a day. So my Twitter can hit 100K followers or I should be selling all this stuff. And it's like, dude, no, every single one of those people, they were actually hermits in a cave for six months. And that's why they're successful now. So if you're currently in hermit stage, just keep being a hermit. <laughs> you can't do it for too long because eventually you just like fade into obscurity. But it does take a long time to make really good, really valuable things. And you have to just remind yourself of that. 
This was an incredibly helpful conversation for me as I'm still in the early stages of building this YouTube channel and I hope it was helpful for you as well. You can see why Thomas has been so successful and just how intentional he is about all the details in his business. If you want to learn more about Thomas, you can visit his website, thomasjfrank.com, or you can find him on YouTube at Thomas Frank or Thomas Frank Explains for his Notion content. Links to all of that are in the show notes. Thanks to Thomas for being on the show. Thank you to Connor Conaboy for editing this show. Thank you to Nathan Tonhunter for mixing the show and Brian Skeel for creating our music. If you like this episode, leave a comment on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, or if you're listening on audio, be sure to leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.